Is there any immunologic evidence that people with Crohn's disease have immune deficiencies? And there's been two uh, fascinating studies that came out of a group in London, England in the past few years that have directly tested for that. So the first one, this is from Anthony, Dr. Siegel's group in, in London. The first one, they asked the question, if, if we do an endoscopic biopsy on a patient, how does it heal? So what they did, which is very clever, is they went back to biopsy the biopsy site. And then they could look at the biopsy site to say how many cells migrated into the biopsy site later that day, and how well was it healing? And not only did they ask that question, but they also very cleverly said, well, maybe this has nothing to do with the gut. What if I just cut a little slit in the skin and I do the same thing? How well does that skin cut heal? And they even put killed E. coli bacteria into the skin, and they say, how well do people respond to these different insults, cuts, and bacteria? And no matter how they measured it with a whole bunch of different, very innovative immunologic tests, they found the same thing that compared to control patients, and the controls were healthy people, the controls also were people with rheumatoid arthritis, so people who had a different inflammatory disease. Compared to those controls, the Crohn's patients consistently had weaker immune responses to these different insults. So that was an interesting observation, but is that the reason you'd have chronic inflammation, or is that just some sort of a, a result of what's going on? They did this in people who were in remission and who were not on immune suppressive drugs. So this wasn't just simply the consequence of being on methotrexate or something like that. But it still didn't explain a sort of a sequence of events. And so what they did, they followed it up with another series. These are studies that um, clearly they had to think through very carefully and justify very rigorously to their uh, clinical investigation board. What they did is they took E. coli and they labeled it with radioactive phosphate. And then they took the neutrophils from the patients and took them out of, their patient, uh, out of the patient into the lab. And they labeled those with a different nuclear marker called indium. And then what they did is they put the E. coli into the skin and they put the neutrophils into their veins. And they asked, how well do the neutrophils migrate to the place where you just put bacteria into the person? And how well does the person get rid of the bacteria that were just squirted into their skin? And they found that compared to Crohn's patients, uh, control patients, sorry, the Crohn's patients were defective. They had less migrations, like they were less aware that they had an infection. They had less migration of cells to the site of infection. And they had impaired, cl impaired clearance of bacteria where they put the bacteria to the skin. So they set up this model where defective early handling of a bacteria would lead to a chronic infection. And then a chronic infection would be the driver of chronic inflammation. So you sort of say, well, that's kind of an interesting model. It doesn't sound like autoimmunity at all. It sounds like immune deficiency. So we have an allergy and we have immunology. Is this, uh, is this compatible with the other data coming out? Well, there's been, as you all are quite aware, uh, a revolution of uh, genetics and genomic studies and Crohn's disease and IBD have been really at the forefront of some of the seminal studies using these new technologies. So what you want to know is what are the Crohn's diseases, Crohn's genes, I should say. Do these genes suggest an autoimmune process or do these genes instead suggest an immune deficiency process? And how does this fit with these different questions? When I ask myself, what's Crohn's gene, I just want to be clear that you know what I'm thinking about. There are genes that have been associated with any type of IBD in the published study. There are genes that have been associated with Crohn's disease in the study, but then were linked with ulcerative colitis in somebody else's study. And then there are genes that have been associated with Crohn's disease in multiple studies, and that have never been associated with ulcerative colitis. It's that latter group that I consider the Crohn's specific genes. So that's a very small subset. So if you hear that there's 50 genetic loci that have been associated with IBD, and then you see that I'm going to show three, and you think Bear isn't really up on the literature, you're right, the literature is moving very fast, but I'm only talking about that very unique subset of Crohn's specific genes. So what are they? To me, the key ones that have been reproduced across different labs in different settings are called NOD2, ATG16L1, and IRGM. Now, these are very long 
complicated papers that I find are difficult to read. They have lots of color figures that are beautiful, but I don't really know exactly what's in them. And then they have these appendices and supplemental figures and supplemental tables. So I don't expect you to understand them because I don't understand all the details about how they do these things. But what I do read in these papers is some sort of a common thread. So this paper, uh, there were two that came out in Nature in 2001 on the gene called NOD2, and the authors say the results suggest a link between the immune response to bacterial components and development of disease. So I didn't write that, that's what Obira wrote, okay? In this group, uh, Hampa from Germany wrote that the ATG16L1 gene codes a protein in the pathway that processes intracellular bacteria. And these guys say that taken together, the evidence regarding this gene, their gene, this gene, and another one that has subsequently been associated with ulcerative colitis. They say, taken together, the evidence implicates defects in innate, which means early, immune pathways and handling of intracellular bacteria. So the geneticists are saying, you should be looking at how the host deals with intracellular bacteria. That's what they're writing. <coughs> so how would that work exactly? If you simplify it, NOD2 seems to be involved in bacterial recognition, and these other guys are involved in a process called autophagy. Autophagy, for those of you who took Latin, like I did in school, means to eat yourself, which doesn't sound very attractive, but it's a process of cells eating internal, uh, it's a recycling system of, of cells eating internal processes, and including infections. So it's a way to digest things that are in the cell and to kill them off. So you can simplify all the genetics to say bacterial recognition, bacterial killing. Okay, so NOD2 tells the cell that there is an infection, and autophagy tells the cell how or helps the cell to kill an intracellular bacteria. So how does this fit now with the analogy, and how does this fit with the immunology? When the paper by, uh, the second paper by Dr. Siegel's group came out, we were asked to put this together in some sort of a new working model. And this is what we kind of came up with our diagram, is that faced with a bacterial infection, you would normally have recognition of that in infection by the NOD2 protein. In our work, we show that NOD2 instructs innate early responses to infections and adaptive immune responses. That means developing antibodies and lymphocytes in that second phase. And we know that innate and adaptive immunity are important for eliminating and invading bacteria. We also know that after bacterial infection, the recognition by NOD2 instructs that process called autophagy. Two papers came out uh, in late 2009, early 2010, directly linking NOD2 to autophagy. So saying that these Crohn's genes aren't on different pathways, they're different checkpoints on the same pathway. And we know that autophagy is a cellular system responsible for eliminating bacteria. So what we have is during the normal course, if you've got the normal genes, an infection leads to recognition and either cellular killing or immune-based uh, killing, and eventually you get rid of the infectious organism. However, if you have mutations in NOD2 or mutations in autophagy, then what you're going to have is a predisposition to pathogen persistence, where the bacteria is going to stick around, and that chronic infection could, in theory, if you think it through, lead to chronic inflammation. Exactly how that happens is something I'm going to come back to. It's easy to say, but any time you see a diagram in a medical or scientific paper with one arrow, you have to ask yourself very carefully, what's the evidence for that arrow? In this case, that arrow is two different papers that came out. But when you see somebody who has three or four arrows in a row, it means they're kind of making it up, and they don't really know what's going on. So although I put this thing here and that thing there, I'm not pretending I know exactly what would happen between pathogen persistence and pathogen-driven inflammation. It's just a hypothesis. It's a working model. So in my view, the immune deficiency model of Crohn's disease uh, is supported by analogy, immunology, and genetics. Is that is that the end? We could just sort of stop the talk and go for lunch, or do we say, hold on, now we have to figure out what to do about it. I believe that's actually the platform where you now have to start the work and say, okay, well, what would happen between having a 